Welcome to the Working Tools Podcast, where today we will be discussing Chapter 2 of Observing the Craft by Andrew Hammer. Ladies and gentlemen, brethren all, welcome to the Working Tools Podcast, a casual conversation around Freemasonry. First, it's important to note that our thoughts and opinions are our own and do not reflect those of our Grand Lodge or respective craft or concordant bodies. Please connect with us and ask questions via our website at theworkingtoolspodcast.com. Today on the Working Tools Podcast, we have our usual crew of four. We have Worshipful Brother Stephen Chung from Prince Charles Lodge Number 153 in Kelowna, British Columbia. Worshipful Brother Jared Dunham of Penticton Number 147 in Penticton, British Columbia. Very Worshipful Brother David Colbeth from King Solomon Lodge Number 60 in Auburn. And I'm Matt Apple, and I'm a member of Mill Creek Number 243 in uh, Montlake Terrace, Washington. I also want to say, by the way, by way of introductions, I, I meant to say it earlier, David and I actually got to sit and lodge together the other day. It was kind of exciting. Mm -hmm. It was the first time that he and I have, I think, other than Grand Lodge, which doesn't really count. So that was fun. Um, so chapter two of the book here, in my opinion, is, is sort of like chapter 2A and chapter 2B. And there's a, a dividing line at, some, at a point in the, I think it's on page 11 or 10, or eh, somewhere in, in that book, where it sort of goes from being an analysis of what observing is to uh, looking at some some things that are not observant shall we say in his opinion so uh, i think we're gonna we're gonna sort of do 2a in this case we're gonna look at the first first half of the of the chapter and i guess my first general calls it out to everyone question is what'd you think well i'm liking it so far um my problem is is i don't you know, retain too well. So I didn't want to carry on too far, but then I just kept diving into, into more and into the next one. And, uh, uh, so far, you know, it's pretty on point. Yeah, I think I agree. I think we've talked about that. Like in the, I, I was listening to the first show that we did. I haven't listened to chapter one again, but we we appropriately called it was a guidebook. It, it's I think Jared said it was the guidebook to a successful lodge, basically. And I would continue to agree with that. I I, I think it's if if you could make it required reading for you an officer, <laughs> for sure, and any member that's dedicated, uh, boy, that'd be. And again, it's not that this is the holy grail or the the what's all, but it's certainly I, we we have a book. I don't know if you have a. a we, in addition to our code and constitutions, we have a, a book called the Lodge Officers Handbook, and it's not and it's not the standard work, and it's not the code, but it's just a it's a written and approved guide for responsibilities and duties and maybe suggested floor work and things like that. But it's just a guide. But I've always said, if you don't have anything else to, if you don't know what else to do, do what's in the Lodge Officers Handbook. Just do that, and then if the lodge has a custom of its own, then you can incorporate the custom or whatever else or if the grandmaster says to do something, obviously you do that. Or if the master of the lodge says to do something, but if you don't know what else to do, do that. So I think that's falls in line with this book too. If you don't know what else to do, this is a good guide. Yeah, there was in the the previous chapter we were discussing. I at one point I felt like we should say something along the lines of observing the craft doesn't mean you know looking at it from a distance and going, oh, look, there's the craft. I'm, I'm looking at it. I'm observing it. It's not that kind of observation. And I thought about making some sort of comment about it, and apparently I didn't read far enough ahead because the first the first chapter of this book spells it out really clearly what he what observance is. And uh, um, we were talking about a careful attention to the practice of what might be considered the essential tenets of the discipline. And I sort of feel like the next, I don't know, three pages after that are, yeah, that's really true. <laughs> It's a that he defined it, and then he he goes on to talk about it in a, sort of in a Masonic sense. But it's I I don't feel like he ever goes up any higher up the mountain than he did in that very first paragraph. And right after that, I wrote the I line about decorum, excellence, and ritual, and reverence for the same. And so I think, would you agree or not that those are what he's referring to as the tenets of observance? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Come on, Jared. It's an audio show. We got to talk. I know it's an audio show, but the problem is, that was a simple book. Is like, 
And on the last episode, I I, I pointed out I I I I mean observing the craft. He's talking about craftsmanship. And I mean, I think he really wanted to use the word craftsmanship, but crafting the craft would, you know, sort of, I think, you know, or Masonic craftsmanship, like it just, it wouldn't have the same, but yeah, that's what he's talking about is that, you know, focusing on the things that we do in Lodge to the best of our ability in which, and by doing that, we get closer to the intellectual and spiritual enlightenment that we're looking for. That, you know, this isn't a, you can't gloss over ritual. You can't gloss over, you know, memory work. Like if, if you don't pay attention, give it the proper due attention, you're not going to get out of Freemasonry what's there to be gotten out of it. Yeah. And I, I appreciated too that he talked about that observance is a state of mind. It's an attitude almost, if you will. And right. then the body manifests this attitude or state of mind and then the union of those are what you draw into your soul and become essentially right so the, the, and i wrote a little diagram with you know the circles intertwining circles mind body and soul and in the middle is observance when that when it's bring those three together well and then there's a I, I highlighted another quote just a couple pages for it's weird how we have the same things highlighted in our books it's, it's you know it's like but it's like it's um uh observe when, when you're approaching the craft of this everything one does in a lodge from the lights to regalia to our physical movements becomes a pursuit of excellence there's that craftsmanship uh, of that state of betterness that allows us to distinguish the masonic world of the lodge from the profane world outside so there's also that that whole concept of observing the craft is you have by observing the craft you actually alter the lodge room from just a building that a bunch of guys meet into something higher and isn't that cool it is you know and that's why and i've, I've got a little marginal note in here is uh like where it says this is why opening and closing is so important and when it's done right like because that is it, it, the it's opening, when you, happening when you open pump. your lodge you're going from the profane to the sacred and when you close your lodge you're closing the sacred and allowing yourself to go back to the profane and it's like that that's why i always get so grumbly when when opening and closings aren't done well because it when you stumble through it it, it, it ruins the flow you, you're not going into that higher realm i hate to use that way but like that you know what i mean like that you know you're you're not getting mentally prepared for you know the enlightenment that you're searching for is just it throws you off it's it's it, it's like it's like not doing your warm-up properly for a run it just throws the entire run off i would i wouldn't know anything about that but <laughs> <laughs> for, for those that you are only listening <clears throat> get a picture of me soon <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not the epitome of the body portion of that mind, body, and spirit. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he, I also think later in that he, while I agree it's to focus ourselves while we're in the room, but I aligned a section that says seeking to manifest it outwardly t through their actions. And so I took that as while, yes, we're supposed to be sacred in that space. We're also supposed to make ourselves better so that we can carry ourselves out into the world and be the example. Yes. Okay. I'm not, okay. But, but you're not going to learn that. But once again, you're not going to learn that lesson well. Like, because you don't, if, you can't be that better person outside of the lodge if you don't learn that lesson well inside the lodge. So. Can I get any man? So can, can, uh, <laughs> <laughs> whoop, whoop. <laughs> yeah, I, I wrote, we're, we're engaged in ex exercise of personal development for the benefit of self and society. So it's not just about us either. It's about, we, we are almost, I think we're almost charged to take it out of the lodge, which we are, I mean, in our part of our section, we are charged to take it out of the lodge, but <laughs> To, to better ourselves and thereby better society. But by bettering ourselves, don't we automatically better society? That's, I think that's the point. Well, like that's, that, that, that's always one of the things that I always, I find people focus too much on is that the better, like they don't realize that 
they think that you have to go out and make a big impact. Right that, right. that the bigger the impact you make, the better you're doing. And it's like, but if you yourself are a good person that has a trickle, oh, we're going to go into trickle down betterness. It's like, <laughs> but it, it does. It has the effect of when, you know, because you know, that old commercial of, you know, if you tell two friends and they tell, it's true that if you're a good person, that will inspire someone else to be a better person, which inspires others to be better. And it improves society in sort of that ripple effect that we see. You know, so I, I sometimes worry that I think Mason's focus too much on, and this is going back to some of the other, uh, some of our older episodes where we talk about, where we focus, we especially in um, uh, the Whither Are We Traveling, where they talk about, you know, the, the charitable works and stuff and focusing too much on the impact, not on the act. That, you know, we need to be, we need to be better. We need to be that beacon that goes out into the world and makes people go, oh, I want to be like them. Well, not like this, but like them. <laughs> <laughs> well, and he, he mentions that the craft is a method of instruction to higher things. It's not those higher things themselves. And so right. masonry isn't the higher thing. It's the pathway. It's the instruction. It's the method. It's the, you know. Right. He keeps, the, the word he uses so often in this book is enlightenment. Which and I know he's it's because he's trying to bring it back to the the you know um and the the era of enlightenment in the 18th century and stuff, but it, it's that true thing that you know that you know like you said is it's the lessons are there, not the answers. I like that. I'm gonna write that down. Jared, you do that. Uh, Jared said <laughs> <laughs> it's yours twice, and then I get to take it. <laughs> Use it twice today and it shows forever. So what did you guys think about? There's a paragraph in here. Well, in my book, it's at the bottom of page 10, but it, probably not for Jared's fancy book. Uh, does that mean that non-Masons uh, and society as a whole are left without the knowledge that they are somehow, ah, unless they are somehow brought into the craft? And he talks about how none of these lessons really are, are lessons that you can only find in Masonry, but that they're out there this masonry just happens to be uh, so i'm putting words in his mouth now but the masonry just happens to be a vehicle that we use for these lessons is that i i found that interesting i'm, I'm not sure i have a strong opinion about it one way or the other but i really found that interesting to think about yeah well, I think the important thing is he uses the term it's a magnet because he says in there it's the uh freemason has been a repository or magnet for the world's great philosophical ideas and i think that's the that's that whole attraction thing is that of you know, we go out in the world and do good and it attracts. I think, I think that's what he, because I know that a lot of the early Masons were part of correspondence circles where, you know, they would, letters would be sent around with new ideas, scientific, philosophical and stuff, and they would read and write back to each other their thoughts on it. So I think that's sort of what he's alluding to as well, is that we didn't, we didn't, we didn't start the fire. No, we didn't come up with this idea. But the ideas of what the people that did were attracted to Freemasonry, and by that extent, the ideas were attract were attributed to us. Yes, no. Yeah, I agree, and that, that's I, like I said. We're the, I think it's the method of instruction. The craft is. He says just before that, just after that, what Matt said, and just before the idea of the method of instruction that you know, before universities and societies and, and higher learning was available. The middle class was even thought of really lodges sought to be the universities of the common man. So I think you're exactly right. Both of you that, that it drew masonry drew those out men out their people out men that out that were looking for higher information, higher thoughts and higher deeds and, uh, or had them and they brought, were brought together through that. I kind of found that <clears throat> um, that that point that Matt brought up was was rather interesting, and it made me wonder, you know, I mean, because it says there were the lessons of Freemasonry or not, and never have been found exclusively within its doors, right? So where where else are there, are they taught, and how are they presented? I guess was the question that entered my mind at that point, um, because. Freemasonry is the only organization I've ever known that you know does what it does in it in its in the 
particular way that we do it. So you know, how could the lessons that are being uh, that we're being exposed to be exposed to others? Right. So you know, it, was, it left me where where else? Right. Because I don't know anywhere else that you can get the same enlightenment as he refers it. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to pose a question that we can talk about at a future show in six months. <clears throat> Would Freemasonry exist without God? That's a, that's a different question, but I think it relates to what Steve's saying. He's in this corner for me, uh, that the idea of higher thoughts and, and didn't originate with Freemasonry, right? They, they, one of the one of the ideas could have been through a spiritual awaken, awakening and Freemasonry expounded on that and brought different lessons and ideas. No, I can see that Jared's just biting his tongue. Well, my question, okay, so I, I want I want a better definition of you know when you say could Freemasonry exist without God, you mean a supreme being. That's a whole. That's a whole other show. <laughs> okay, so okay, yeah, yeah, we need another show because that, yeah, that you, that's a can of worms that we're going to have to. <laughs> but to Stephen, it, 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 it was a it was a topic. We we have a a new. I, don't, I hate to call it a social event. It's it's a new philosophical meeting that we're we're exploring with our local members in our district, and we're our first one, but mostly social. But then it one kind of winded down. We got into some individual deep discussions about that, and one of them was religion in general and then this young he's a brand new mason and he posed the question hey we have a topic for next our next get together what is what would freemason exist without god and i thought oh that's going to be interesting <laughs> I, I want to bring it up to the guys <laughs> anyway but sorry to distract well, well i was just Stephen. i was asking that i'll point out scouting scouting teaches a lot of the same lessons that freemasonry does about good citizenship and Intellectual but did that exist before Freemasonry? Hmm, sorry, did that exist before Freemasonry? Scouting, no, but he's not talking about. But we're talking about now. We're not talking about back then. Oh, I suppose. I, I guess I, I thought Stephen's Steve question was: Is what organization does this? Sure. Now it may not. I'll be to be honest. No, I, as far as I understand my history, and I mean it, it it's dodgy at best. But I, I would say that there were. There might have been other organizations, but they were similar. But in modern times, we have quite a few organizations that do very similar things to Freemasonry. Yeah, okay. To an extent, it, yeah, I can see what you mean. The scouting does that. Demolay does that. Um, but, you know, Demolay was, you know, started by a Mason, so. Um, and that's next chapter. Yeah. <laughs> right, so. I suppose I, I suppose scouting does to an extent. Um, well, and I think in, in, in its own way, way, yeah. Modern days, I mean, universities and other higher thought processes do some, you know, some oh, yeah. enlightenment. If you're looking at, I, I think it's a, I would. He was talking about. I thought he was talking about in the past, essentially what what prior to masonry, and it would you'd have to go back to the enlightenment age and. You know the philosophical well, like i said yeah correspondence circles you know the, the royal society started up i mean there were similar things yeah there was whatever the salons where they got together and talked about well sometimes art but philosophy too philosophy yeah that's more of a french 18th century but yes yeah, same thing same concept they where you would get together and people would you know discuss a topic I, you know i thought it was interesting he, he said somewhere in here that uh, they would the idea of social time that, and I think we're gonna. I'm gonna. I'm not mean to get into the next section here, but he was talking about how social time was really to refresh themselves after the days long discussion of philosophical ideas and <laughs> the the mental uh, exercise. <laughs> you need to recharge the batteries. Right. I thought you're thinking so hard that you got to have. Food? To, I, I guess. I mean, I suppose. I suppose. No, it's a, it's a, it's a training in, experience. In my toga, in my, I guess the guys in togas needed it. <laughs> so the other paragraph that that really stood out to me that I kind of wanted to ask your guys' opinion on is this sort of the, the last paragraph of of 
chapter 2a if you will um where he says uh in my book it's at the bottom of page 12 at this point is it important to talk a bit about how one prepares to become observant and then he sort of launches into oh yeah what he thinks is not observant but i don't know that i ever got the feeling for how one prepares to become observant is, is that in there and i just missed well, it? i i have a i have a, a on mine page 19 at the bottom of the page <laughs> Um, it says is that I underline the fact that a Mason cannot become observant on his own. He must do it within an observant lodge where these principles are being embraced and employed. So I think that's a very, that, that at least my takeaway is that that's a very important part of that. It's a lot. It, it, it's sort of like you're not an, a, an observant lodge makes observant Masons, but you cannot be an observant Mason without an observant lodge. It's a group effort. Like you, you may be, cause I mean, you may be doing everything you can in your lodge to be observant, but if the lodge around you is not following the same principles, it's almost fighting against you trying to become observant and you're a better person. Is it that they have to all be, I guess they would, I was going to say, I was, would they have to be all observant Masons or would they all just have to be Masons with a common desire to be observant i mean or to 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 do better and all those i think i think what at least my as i said my takeaway from this is that the lodge the, the focus of the lodge needs to be these principles and that when the lodge focuses on these principles the members of that lodge are being observant okay that if your whole lodge is basically the whole lodge has to be on board otherwise it isn't going to work well and and that was uh uh a good question because I that I was asking myself that if if I want to be more observant of these things and the rest of the lodge you know isn't on the same page is that going to happen and was, I, I said how could it not if I'm paying more attention I'm striving to uh, be the better version of me and improve myself in the things that I'm doing and working on. Um, I think that's making me uh, a more observant Mason. And really the fact that the rest of my lodge might not be doing that. Um, maybe as a lodge, we're not being an observant lodge, but I'm still being an observant Mason. And that was where I came to with it. And I, I, I think his argument, and I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to speak for the author anyway. I think, because I think the argument he would make, or at least that I get from the book, is that you're not truly being able to get to an observe, you're not truly being fully observant because if you're like, and I, to use the example of the opening and the closing, if, if, you're, if the opening and closing is done poorly and you don't get into that state where the lodge has become sacred, no matter what you're doing, it's not being observant. Like you may be, you may think like, I, I really think it's an all or none principle. That I, I, I think that if, if, if there are, if your lodge isn't like, if, if your lodge is not conducive for you to get into the state of mind needed to be observant while at lodge, if, if there are distractions in lodge of people not doing ritual properly or, you know, there, you know, you haven't been able to get into that proper state of mind for enlightenment, then you're not being able to be truly observant. Yeah, I challenge that. I, I challenge that because um, <clears throat> my ability to focus on um, the betterment of these things, the de uh, whether it's the delivery of ritual or or um, by myself or somebody else in lodge, uh, as long as I'm focusing on me and working on making me better, then I am being observant. I, I don't think I need the other guys in the lodge to be doing the same thing for me to be able to say I am there, right? I, I think it's better and I think it would be more enlightening if they were all on the same page and um, the conversations were in the same direction, I think it would make it a whole lot easier, more enjoyable, and maybe more 
fulfilling or more so, uh, making that experience better. You've just made my point. Is that you aren't actually able to get the full experience. You've just said you aren't. So no, yeah, I said any, it could make the experience better. You're not being fully observant. But, mm. but like we talked about on the last show, though, I think Matt alluded to that we have like the the in the Buddhist temple, there's got to be the one guy or whatever term you used. I said the, there's got there's got to be a, a somebody that starts it, right? So in Steve's defense, if he is dedicated to the idea of observance and uses the Colbert principle of drip, 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 <laughs> and eventually, you know, maybe maybe not every single person or even the entire lodge is able to accept it, but you can certainly develop groupings, if you will, of observant masons that have like-mindedness and then could effectually influence the lodge at some point, potentially. Like, for example, I would say our meetings themselves are not truly observant in the, we do pretty good ritual. I don't know if it's excellent or not, but we do pretty good ritual. We have a focus on what we're doing. We have our shrink the lodge education piece. There's a lot of things that happen that are maybe observant, but you know, we're, we don't dim the lights and do all that kind of stuff. And, you know, we don't, for our meetings, for degrees we do now, we didn't used to, but drip, drip, drip. <laughs> uh, we do some of those things. I tried to do incense once and people were choking. But anyway, we, we, we've we been trying to add on some features to the candidate experience and other things to be a little more observant. And I think it just takes time, but you have to have one that wants to do it, right? And then can maybe try and influence those others? Yes. <laughs> but my, I'm still going to stick with the sure, argument sure. that until, and, that, and, and I'm trying not to jump, I'm really trying not to jump ahead because it's a lodge thing. It, it, it's not an individual thing. It's a lodge thing. Sounds like, they're, they're, segue, sounds like a good segue to me. Yeah. Like, is he, he yeah. <laughs> So this actually brings up another question that probably falls into the future, uh, since we're running out of time, future subject category. If someone, if uh, someone, a, a person is out there in society doing good and being a better person and studying and improving themselves, even if they're not a member of a lodge, it, again, all these, all, as he says in the book, all these lessons are out there, right? It's not like, not like masonry took them away and, and the, the, no one else knows about them. If you are out there doing those things on some level, are you not a Mason, even if you're not a member of a lodge? No. You're well, a good, maybe you're a good. Never mind. Sorry. <laughs> it wouldn't make a show that never mind. Well, no, because you, you, well, you're a good person, but by definition, you're not a Mason because you haven't gone through the initiatory process. But I, I see what you mean. Is that you know, it, and that's what he says: is that you can be a good person without being a Mason. These aren't you know, these aren't our you know, exclusively our copyrighted property. Right. That's always that's always sort of how I thought about um, making a Mason at site. We don't do that in, in Washington, but in theory, that I always figured it was sort of the grandmaster going out there and finding someone going. You know, this guy's not a member of a lodge, but damn it if he's not doing the right thing. And, you know, you know, you really are a Mason kind of thing. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. Exactly. <laughs> but anyway, so that's that's just my opinion on that. Uh, having expressed the final opinion, have have we all, uh, is there, are there more commentary on part 2A of the of the observing the craft here? Or I, I think it'll be fluid. No, but. All right. No, I could argue the point more and longer, but Jared's just going to have the same answer. <laughs> if the answer's right. <laughs> yeah, I say, if, I, I always say, if the shoe fits, cram it on. <laughs> the, uh, I also think it's kind of funny just watching us on the, on the video as we're talking about this book. We, we all keep like looking down or obviously, you know, slipping the pages or whatever. And yeah, it's, it's just kind of funny watching. There's one person talking and the other three other heads down. We're trying to find that other quote. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 
All right. So with that, uh, I think that wraps up the, the first part of our discussion of Chapter 2 of Observing the Craft. Uh, as before, I, I encourage people to go out and check out the book. Um, we're not going to be reading it as we did the last paper, uh, but we it's it's worth a read on your time. So I, I really suggest that people check it out. And uh, also, tell us what you think. We've gotten a few interesting comments lately about uh, about our stuff out there on, on social media or YouTube or other platforms. And uh, it's just interesting to see what what folks think of uh, what we're what other opinions there are out there about what we're talking about. That's what I'm trying to say. So, uh, with that, on behalf of uh, Stephen and Jared and David and myself, we thank you all for listening to the Working Tools podcast, and we'll talk to you again soon. Goodbye.